We'll be in Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17. But to get the full thought, we're going to go back to verse 1, and we're going to read from verses 1 all the way through verse 17. And then what I plan on doing um, for teaching style today is not necessarily doing all the talking, but just asking a lot of questions to help us learn how to study the Bible for ourselves. Um, a big part of my job as a pastor is not to make meals for you, but to teach you how to cook for yourself um, and feed yourself. So it's good, um, obviously, as a <clears throat> a mother to feed your kids, but sometimes when your kids are seven years old, you will be able to make their own sandwich. So that's part of what we're going to do today is learn how to study the Bible for ourselves. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 1. <clears throat> it says this, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. We were dead in trespasses and sin. God in His grace has saved us. If you have been saved, you have been raised by the same power that raised Christ from the dead. You have been given a new life, and this new life should not be concerned with the dead things of this world. This new life should be concerned with the one who raised you from the dead, that is, with Christ, seeking the things which are above. So in light of that, verse 2, set your affections on things above, not on the things on earth. In other words, we are to be thinking about eternal things, things that matter, not the things of this life, the things that are going to perish and die. Um, Jesus would speak of it in terms of setting your, uh, um, storing up treasures in heaven. Verse 3, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. We have died to this world. In other words, the the, the power of Satan over us has been broken through our death with Christ, and our life is now tied with Christ. This is really, really important in talking about our salvation. Um, the, the illustration that I've used for many years is if you have been, if you went back in the 1800s and you were a slave your entire life working on a plantation, every morning you have to get up before the crack of dawn, every time your master calls your name, you have to say, yes, sir. Every time you see that whip, you know he's going to lash you, you do what you're told. The Emancipation Proclamation comes, and you're free. And you wake up, and you see the sun coming through the window, and you go, oh, I'm late. You see the master walking down the road. What happens? Oh, he's going to get on me. You see a whip that somebody's carrying in town. Instantly, you have flashbacks. But you're free. You're free from that. And that's what he's speaking of, of us being dead. Okay, We are free from all the fears and powers of this world. We're free from the power of Satan. And because of this, our life is tied with the life of Christ, which is eternal. Eternal life begins now. It is not something that comes in the future. So verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, okay, Christ, our life, will appear, we will also appear with him in glory. In other words, we're living for eternity, not for the here and now. In light of this, we put to death our members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, or ornate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. In other words, because of what Christ has done, we now put to death the work of the flesh. We now have the spirit is alive, but we are still the spirit is still contained in the flesh, and there's still a warfare there. We are to put to death or crucify or mortify our sinful desires. Okay? And verse 6, the reason we do this is because these are the very things that crucified God, our crucified God's Son, because the wrath of God is poured out on those who continue in these things. Because of this, verse 7, we used to live this way, but because we now have a new life in Christ, we're not going to live this way anymore. So how do we mortify these things? Well, he's going to describe it in terms of changing clothes. Okay, You take off the old... And then our text we're going to look at in verses 12 is this is what you are to put on, okay? But what do we take off? We take off anger. We take off wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, lying, okay? Why? Because that we've put off the old man. The old man has died. With Christ, it has been crucified, it is buried, it has gone away. We are not that person anymore. And because we are not that person anymore, we cease to do those things. We're not going to do those things anymore. Verse 10 is really beginning the context for verse 12. And have put on the new man. Just the same way you take off one shirt, now you've put on a different shirt. You've put on a new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 
This new man, as we grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ, we become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the goal, as we're going to put on the righteousness of Christ and we are going to begin to look like Jesus. This is a really important concept. Okay? When we talk about repenting, we think of repenting as I'm going to stop doing bad stuff. However, repentance has got to be a full turning. You have to turn from something to something. And so often we only focus on the don't do as opposed to the do. Okay? I've had this conversation many, many times before with different people. When you say things like, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be treating your wife this way, or you shouldn't treat your kids this way, or you shouldn't act this way towards your husband. Well, that's not very helpful unless you come along and say, instead, this is what you should. Have you ever had someone who never taught you how to do something that was critical of the way you did it? Okay. So, so sometimes, you know, parents will be things like, well, you need to clean your room. And then you come, hey, my room's clean. They come in there, it's not clean. Well, what does clean look like? You have to teach them. You have to show them. And so often when it comes to the Christian life, we tell people, put it off, but we never tell them to put it on. We say, you shouldn't do this. Great. Well, then what do I do with these actions? And, and, and we've done this a lot with a lot of sexual sins. We've done this with a lot of other things. We'll say things, for example, like, abortion's bad. Okay, well, then what am I supposed to do as a single mom? Well, we, we, don't, we don't address that. We do things like homosexuality is bad. Okay, well, what do I do with these desires? Pornography is bad. Okay, well, what do I do with these urges? And we never once deal with what you're supposed to do. Paul in, in Colossians chapter 3 says, put off and put on. Jesus gives a, a story, and in, 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 I believe it's in the Gospel of Matthew, and it may be repeated in Luke as well where he talks about the man who has the evil spirit. You remember the story? The man has the evil spirit. The spirit departs from him. And you remember, he cleans his whole house. And he goes outside, and he goes back inside. And what happens? He takes in seven more, and the end is worse than the first. This describes, in many respects, the Christian life. If you repent of a bad action and then expect to sit there and do nothing you're going to instantly go and find something else worse. What the gospel is about is instead of living this way, you must now live this way. Okay? So he goes on the putting off and the putting on. In verse 11, he speaks about how there's not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. And then that brings us to verse 12. And that's what we want to focus on. Okay? We've talked about what we're supposed to put on. He said, we're supposed to put on the new man. Okay, what does the new man look like? Give me some specifics of what I am to vote myself to. The first one that he says, and it's interesting because he says the elect of God. Okay, why would he bring up election? Well, whenever we talk about election and predestination, we think of election and predestination differently. We think of election and predestination as heaven or hell. That's what we think of it. But in Romans chapter 8, what are we predestined to? Okay, there's good works in Ephesians 2, but what, what specifically the good works has a goal in mind? And what is that end goal? What is the destination of predestination? Uh, Romans chapter 8. Okay, let's, let's look at that real quick. All, all of those are correct answers, but they're not the specific answer. Okay, predestination simply means to determine the destination ahead of time. So what is the destination? In Romans chapter 8, okay, verse 29, this is talking about election. Somebody read verse 29 and tell me what the destination is. Ah, there you go. <laughs> what is it? That's the destination. We, we go, okay, predestination, heaven or hell. No. Predestination is I'm going to take you and you will look like my son, Jesus Christ. That's predestination. So he comes and he reminds us of that. If you're elect, okay, when we think of the, the elections in November, the president-elect, what is he? He is going to be the president. That's what's going to happen. 
If you are elect, guess what you're going to be? Like Jesus Christ. So that's where he begins. You're going to be like Jesus Christ. Well, how does Jesus look? How does Jesus act? Okay, well, before he answers that question, he begins to give us what this is going to look like. What is the next word? After he says, the elect of God, he says, holy. Okay, we are going to be holy. We are going to be set apart. We are going to be distinct. The word holy um, has within it a connotation of otherness. In other words, you don't fit in. As a Christian, you can be on the same baseball team wearing the exact same cleats, the exact same cleats, the exact same shirt, play in the exact same team. But as a Christian, your attitude and actions and everything in the locker room and on the field is not going to fit in with the team. You're going to be a part of it, but you're not going to be a part of it. This is being in the world, but not of it. And that's something that we have to embrace as Christians. You find this in, in Hebrews 11. It says they embraced being strangers. Okay, The word there is the idea of being an alien. You don't belong. And this is something that almost every Christian who is, is serious in their walk with the Lord, they, 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 they have this feeling. They go to the class reunion, and they belong, but man, I just don't fit in. When they go to a family reunion and, and they go around the rest of their family that's not Christian, everybody's happy to see them and they're happy to be there and they're happy to catch up with their cousins. But you begin to realize, like, I have the same last name, I have the same DNA, but I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not there. In the workplace, in the classroom, I, I talk to Christians all the time. They're like, you know, I just, I just feel out of place. That's because you are. You've died to this world. You've been risen with Christ. The old man's gone. You've put on the new. Part of that is otherness. But he also gives us another term. We're supposed to put on as the elect of God, holy and what? Hmm? Holy and pleasing. Holy, and some translations have beloved. Okay? Okay? What is he trying to get at there? When you feel out of place, do you feel like that people love you and accept you like they love and accept others? No. How many of you have ever been in a workplace where you may be the high achiever on the team, but you just don't feel accepted like everybody else? You may be with your lost family members, and yes, you're the only one that's, you know, you know, not billions of dollars in debt, and you're the only one that's, you know, on speaking terms with your kids, and yada, 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 yada. But you still just feel, I don't belong here. I'm not accepted here. What he reminds us is you are accepted, you are loved by the only one that matters. You may not feel that you fit in, but you are accepted by God the Father. That's a really good reminder for us, okay? So, what is the next thing? Okay, holy and beloved, what is the next word that he uses? Compassionate hearts, okay? Uh, King James has bowels of mercy, okay? Huh? Tender mercies. The idea here of the word mercy is really dealing with an attitude of compassion towards others, and the word for the bowels or tender or hearts is that, that, that it's just supposed to flow out of your inmost being. This is part of what we're looking at with Jonah. Okay? Part of looking at with Jonah is we do not want to have the heart, the bowels, if you will, of Jonah. We want to have a different heart. What is God's heart towards us? He's compassionate. He's merciful. And if I'm going to look like Jesus, one of the things I love about Jesus is that all the time Jesus is encountering um, the woman with the issue of blood, the woman, the Canaanite woman. He's, he's encountering um, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's encountering demon-possessed people. And one of the things that you find about Jesus that is absolutely remarkable 
is he has time for everyone. He's compassionate. If you were to read the four Gospels and you were to describe Jesus' interaction with his fellow man, you know what you would say? He has a heart filled with tenderness and compassion towards human beings. So if I'm going to be like Jesus, what do I need to put on? I need to put on a heart that is this way. It's not enough to say, I'm not going to hate you. I must now learn to love you in merciful and compassionate ways. So often we only preach one side. We preach, thou shalt not kill, don't hate, don't hate, don't hate. And we go, well, I don't hate anybody. Yes, but do you have compassion on others? And this is something that we have to fight for. Again, in our, our day that's very similar to Jonah's day, sometimes it's hard to have compassion on people in jail, people on the street corner, people that are yelling and screaming at you over the phone. Sometimes it's hard to have compassion on people who are reaping what they've sowed. But Jesus had compassion on the woman at the well who was reaping what she sowed. And he still had compassion. So that's one of the things we have to do, is we have to make sure that we have a compassion that is not a, a facade, but it actually flows from a, a heart filled with love. How many of y'all have ever experienced a person who put on the appearance of being compassionate, but you could tell it didn't come from the inmost being? Okay. What he wants is not the appearance, not the pretend. We should focus on it coming from the inmost being. What is the next thing that we're supposed to put on? Kindness. Okay. It's not just enough to say, well, I'm not going to cuss people out and yell and scream. Okay. But are you kind? Are you kind to your fellow man? Okay. We, again, we focus on the, well, I didn't punch him. Okay, but were you kind to them? And, and there's a world of difference between, well, I wasn't rude and I was kind. The Pharisees focus on the, well, I didn't do this. Like, for example, the Sabbath. And if you, you, you can see this with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The Pharisees would do things like, well, I didn't break the Sabbath. And Jesus would be like, yeah, but did you focus on God at all? Well, I didn't commit adultery. Yes, but did you actually have a heart devoted to your wife or was your heart wandering after other women? Okay. Well, I didn't kill him. Yes, but did you love him? I didn't curse them out. I wasn't rude. Yes, but were you kind? And this is something that we have to focus on. It's not enough to say, well, here's some, here's some words that I'm not going to say anymore. No, I have to instead focus on being kind. And by the way, if you focus on being kind, you don't have to focus on the words you're not going to use. If you focus on being compassionate, you don't have to focus on all of the other things. And by the way, these contrast a lot with the anger and the wrath that he tells us to put off. Okay? What is the next thing we're supposed to put on? Humility, okay? Um, some translations would re refer to this as, as also a, a humbleness of the mind, okay? It's not just enough to fight against pride. You have to fight for humility, and it's not just a humility, but it's a humility that is actually something we actually think. This is not thinking higher of ourselves than we ought, Okay? Have you ever seen someone who was trying to pretend to be humble? You ever seen that? They know all the right things to do. You know, you ever heard of humble bragging? You know, okay, that, that, that happens where we, we know how to act humble. This is not acting humble. This is thinking humble. Now, the, the, the greatest example of humility, understanding of humility I can give you is pride is a false view of self. In fact, many of the people that are like, oh, nobody likes me, and you go, oh, but they're so, no, they're not humble at all. They have a false view of self. Humility is an accurate view of self. It is not a lesser view of self. It is an 
accurate view of self. Okay? So if you were to bring in Larry Bird and Larry Bird say, oh, I can't play basketball, that is not humility. Okay? That is in many respects of trying to get attention by lying. Okay? Humility is having an accurate view of self and thinking accurately concerning who you are. It is not boasting. It is not bragging. You can be confident and humble. Okay? Some, some of you ladies are very, very confident holding a baby. You don't have to go, well, that's arrogant. You don't have to go, well, I don't even know what I'm doing. Well, how do I hold the baby? No, you, you can hold the baby without going, I'm the best person that's ever lived with babies. Like, you, you have a confidence. It's okay because you understand abilities. That's okay. Sometimes when we talk about humility, churches have this idea of that, that meekness is weakness and that humility is, is inability and humility is the like the like the self-deprecating like I am a horrible human. No, humility is just I have an accurate view of who I am, my limitations, my weaknesses, and I don't pretend any to be anything other than what I am. I don't pretend, I do not act, and I think accurately concerning who I am. And this is part of why he tells us that we are holy and beloved. Because sometimes we have an idea that the most holy person is the person who, who goes, well, nobody likes me and God hates me and I'm under God's wrath. No, that's not, that's not an accurate view. If you are a Christian, God loves you. You are right with God. You are his child. You are accepted in the beloved. And that is by grace, so you should act like it. And going around acting like we're the scum of the earth is not humility. By the same time, acting that we've been saved by our own actions is not humility either. Humility is an accurate view of self and the way that I carry myself and that I think. So this is what I have to do. As I have to Part of my renewal of the mind is I have to remind myself of who I am apart from Christ and who I am in Christ. That's humility. Okay? This is who I am in Christ, and this is what he wants us to do. So, so instead of thinking about the way you've been rejected, the way that you've been made fun of, the way you've been mocked, we are to remind ourselves, this is who I truly am in Christ. And I'm supposed to change my thought process to think about the way the world thinks of me or the way I think of me, the way Jesus Christ thinks of me. This is humility of mind. Okay, what is the next one that we're supposed to do? All right, meekness, okay, humbleness of mind, meekness, okay? Meekness is not weakness, okay? When we think of someone who is meek, we think of someone who is just kind of like in the corner, scared of their own shadow. That is not meekness at all, okay? Um, one of the greatest illustrations in the Bible is Moses, okay? Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote that he was the meekest man to ever live, We'll go, that's arrogant. No, humility is an accurate view of self. So what is Moses' meekness? Now, Moses' meekness is seen in the situation with Aaron and Miriam. Okay, you all remember that story. So let, let's kind of go back and let's rehearse. Who was the one who saw the burning bush? Moses. Who was the one that led the children of Israel out of the promised land? Moses. Who was the one that had all of the ten plagues? Moses. Who was the one that parted the Red Sea? Who was the one that spoke and got God's name? I am. Moses. Who was the one who climbed up Mount Sinai? Who was it that brought the law down from God? Who was the one that God revealed the outline of the tabernacle to? Who was the one that God gave the entirety of his law to in the first five books of the Bible? Who was it that had to wear a veil because his face shone with the glory of God? Okay. Who was jealous and wanted his position? Aaron and Miriam. What would you do if you were Moses and your little, you know, your big brother, big sister came after you. 
I know what I would do. It's like, do you want me to take my veil off so you can see the Shekinah glory of God? Miriam, you're scared. You can't even look at me in the eye because of my face and my holiness. Is that a true statement? It is a true statement. Okay. Well, hey, Miriam, where are the books of the Bible that you wrote? Is that a true statement? Okay. Well, well, Aaron, when did you see the burning bush? Is that true? It's true. Moses has all the cards of the card game. Okay. Hey, he, he's, he's got all of the power, all of the position, all of the facts. No one in their right mind would look at Miriam and say that she even holds a candle to Moses. Does anybody remember? He goes before God and lets God make the decision. That's meekness. Meekness is not a false humility. Well, you're right, guys. I don't know anything about God. That's not true. Meekness is power that is under restraint. That's what it is. Is you have power but you do not exercise it. You have the ability, but you leave the outcome of it to God. What does Jesus do when he is under false trials? Does he have the ability to call thousands of angels? Does he have the ability to literally not even open his mouth, not even wiggle his nose, but just think the thought, and everything around him is completely obliterated and gone? He has that ability. Does he? No. Why? Because he's weak? Because he's unable? Because he lacks the ability? Because he lacks the power? No, because he is meek. We live in a world that exercises its power. Okay? And this is very important when it comes to things like raising children. Sometimes I'm bigger. I have a bigger voice. I am stronger than you. I can drive a car. And that's the way we try to raise our kids. Okay? Well, what happens when your teenage son is bigger than you? Well, he has more power. No, the way we raise our kids is meekness. We have the power, but we do not exercise that power. Okay? And this is something that's so foreign to our world today. Our world says there's the powerful who exercise all of their power, and there's the weak who want all of the power. Christianity is you have all the power, but you leave everything in God's hands, and you just do what you are expected. Okay? It has been, the idea of meekness has also been the idea of a warrior who keeps his sword in the sheath. I could kill you at any time I want to, but I'm not going to. That's meekness. That is what meekness is. And this is very important. This is important for men as they lead their families. This is important for parents as it relates to kids. This is important for elders as it relates to the church. That, that it's not a, a lording it over you because of power and knowledge. This is important as it relates to public servants. Guess what public servants are supposed to do? Serve the public. What, is our, what do our public servants do now? They try to accumulate as much power as they possibly can over their fellow man. We as Christians, though we have all power has been given to Christ that indwells us in the power of the Holy Spirit, we leave things in God's hands and do what we are called to do. That's meekness. That's something that we have to focus on. Yes, you may have all of the answers and you may do all those things, but part of the thing to do is sometimes you just keep your mouth shut and let God work things out. I, I, I've had this with my older children, um, trying to teach them how to behave towards their younger siblings. Okay, 
Um, sometimes little kids are really annoying, especially if you're a big brother or a big sister. And you know what's easiest to do? Pick them up and move them. I don't know about you, but if somebody just picked me up and moved me because I was annoying to them, I would not be happy. And this happens all the time in our, our home, is the little kid will be doing something and the, uh, the big kid will be upset and they'll just say, look. And I have to tell them, you may get your way in the moment and you have the physical ability to do that, but that's not the way you carry yourself. Yes, arguing with a two-year-old is pointless, but there's other ways to get the point across other than ex exercising your power. That's meekness. There is a time, if you're a judge, when you have to them. There is a time when you have to confront. There is a time when you have to exercise your God-given authority and power within the home. That happens. But we are to be a people who keep the sword in the sheath, to be a people who walk in meekness. Okay? What is the next one we're supposed to be and put it on? Long-suffering. Um, I told Lydia this past week, I texted her, it's like, why is it that the only lesson God wants me to learn is patience? It seems like everything in my entire life, just when I think I'm patient enough, God's like, I'm just going to stop everything and make you just sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait. How many years, whether you believe in a young earth or not, how many years did Jesus set in heaven before coming to earth to redeem us? Thousands of years. When Jesus came to this earth, how old was he when he began his ministry? Th 30 years old. Can you imagine being God? The power to heal the power to cast out demons, the most powerful preacher that ever lived, and you go to the synagogue and don't say a word for 30 years. You know, you, you, your, your sister gets sick, and your mom goes and asks the doctor. Do you know how hard that would be to bite your tongue as Jesus? Like, oh, no, don't take that herb. It won't do any good. I know what the problem is. I could just touch her and it would go away. For 30 years, he doesn't heal anyone. He doesn't say anything. He does nothing. That has been a very good reminder of me, for, for me, when God does not work on my timetable, when I don't see the people saved in the time frame that I think they should be saved in. Jesus waited 30 years year until it was God the Father's time. We have to put on patience. Is it good to put on diligence? Is it good to put on a work ethic? Is it good to go share the gospel? Is it good? Yes, 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 yes. But one of the areas that we need to grow, it's a fruit of the Spirit, is patience. If you're going to look like Jesus Christ, you are going to be patient patient with other people, okay? What is the next thing we're supposed to put on in verse 13? Bearing with one another, okay? It's not just enough to be patient as you wait for rain. You have to be patient with real-life human people. You have to put up with people who aggravate you and annoy you. Um, you don't have to raise your hand or say anything but how many of y'all have ever attended church with obnoxious people? And you know what? Jesus loves them, and Jesus puts up with them. Guess what you have to learn? This. Okay? What's the next one that we're supposed to put on? Hmm? Forgiving. Okay? It's not just enough that you tolerate and put up with them. You actually have to forgive them and reconcile with them. Why? Because Jesus forgave them. The gospel is filled with the concept of forgiveness and what happens to people who claim to be Christians and don't forgive. 
It's found throughout all of Scripture. So if I'm going to be like Jesus, it's not enough to say, well, look, I didn't kill him. Great. But what did Jesus do to this person who's wronged you? He forgave them. If you're going to look like Christ, you have to put off the anger and you have to put on forgiveness. What is the next thing that he tells us? Okay. Well, he puts on, put on love, verse 14. Um, let, let's, let's continue. The, uh, I, I kind of skipped over verse 13 on the, um, the forgiveness. He tells us if you have a quarrel or you have a problem, you have a complaint against someone, even as Christ forgave you, so do you. We forgive people. Have you ever forgiven someone who still is obnoxious? Like you forgave them, but like they still get on your nerves. You're the, you're the obnoxious. You're the one that gets on their nerves. Yeah, okay. This is a humility, the accurate view of self coming down. <laughs> um, so, so let me ask you something. Is it possible that after Jesus forgave you, you're still obnoxious and annoying? Yes, it is very possible. Okay? So if Jesus forgives you and still puts up with you, don't you think that if you're going to be the elect who's predestined, the destination that you're going to attain is to look like Jesus, that even the people you forgive who persist in their obnoxiousness, guess what you're going to do? Even though you got a lot of things you could complain about, you're going to put up with them. The next one in verse 14 was to put on love. Okay, Jesus loves. It's not enough to say, I don't hate. The question is, but do you love? I remember talking to someone years ago, and they said something along the lines of, well, I wouldn't kill them, but I wouldn't eat dinner with them. Okay, well, that's a step. <laughs> that's a step in the right direction. But aren't you glad that that's not Jesus' attitude towards you? Jesus doesn't say, well, look, I'm not going to send you to hell, but you're not coming to heaven. No, Jesus loves. So if I'm going to, it's not enough to put off, I have to put on. Love, okay? And he said, how, how does he describe love? The bond of perfection. When you can love the same way Jesus loves, then you are complete in Christ. Well, that's easy. Well, if you're paying attention as we look at Jonah, it's not very easy. There are some people that are easy to love, and there are some people that are difficult to love. Yet, God loves all people the same way. And that's what we have to strive to, is am I loving someone the same way I love myself? Okay. He then goes beyond this, and in verse 15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are called in one body, and be thankful. Okay. What is going to happen? Notice he doesn't say, make the peace of God rule in your heart. He says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. What is going to happen if we take everything that we've looked at here? where you're, you feel out of place in this world, you're dead to this world, you feel out of place at work, you feel out of place at family reunions, you feel out of place on the ball team, you feel out of place at class, you just don't feel like you fit in, you don't feel like you belong, and then when you go to church, you feel like you belong, but then there's people that sin against you, and there's people that are obnoxious, and there's people that try your patience, and all of those type of things, but you got to love them anyway, and you got to forgive them, and as you strive towards that, you know, that's a lot, it's a lot. Even just describing that kind of makes you just... <clears throat> Be patient. And one of the things that I have found is when I take all of the frustrating people in my life before the Lord, God just comes with this peace and says, I got this. My ways are not your ways. My timing's not your timing. I'm working. You can't see it. Be patient. Just continue to love them. Just continue to forgive them. And that's what he wants us to be. Okay? Okay. There are a lot of things that happened to Christ that should have aggravated the snot out of him. I, I relate so much to him going, how long have I been with y'all? How many times have I told you the same thing over and over and over again? But at the same time, Jesus was never flustered. He let God's peace 
He left everything in the Father's hand. And that's what, what Paul is getting at for us, for the Colossians and for us. Hey, we're going to put off all these aggravating things. We're still going to live in an aggravating world. Let God handle it. This is the meekness. Put the sword back in the sheath. Let God take care of it. Okay? But notice it's also that we're called in one body. What does forgiveness and all of that have to do with being in one body? Well, who are you going to have contention with as a Christian? Well, not just the world. You're going to have contention with other Christians. And you know what? You're going to go to worship with people that you've had falling outs with, contention with. And he says, I got this. Be unified. Well, but they're uh, aggravated. Just yes, that's why you have to put on bowels of compassion. That's why you have to put on long suffering. That's why you have to forgive. I got this. My church is unified. I will take care of my own children. This is something I have to tell my kids all the time. I will take care of your little brother. I'll take care of your big brother. You just focus on what you're supposed to do. I'll make them do their chores. You don't, you're not the daddy. It's not your responsibility to go point that out. You just focus on what you're supposed to do. Don't disrupt the unity of the household. I've got it. I'll take care of it. In fact, I can't take care of it right now because I'm not like God because I'm dealing with you right now. And if you would just do what you're supposed to, I'll take care of everything else. That's the attitude that we're supposed to have as Christians. And on top of that, why do you think, I, I, I'd be curious to your thoughts, it should be pretty obvious, but why does he think, say at the end of verse 15, and, and by the way, be thankful. Because you're dealing with aggravating people. And you know what happens when you deal with aggravating people? You grumble and complain. That's what happens. So often, when we have peace and unity in the church, we don't say thanks. And when we do have problems, we don't realize that the problems that we have are not near the problems that we had before we came to faith in Christ. I mean, let, let, let's be honest. Do you really want the problems you had before you came to faith in Christ versus the problems you have now? God has been gracious. God has been good. Have a heart filled with thanksgiving. That helps us with these things. So verse 16 answers this question. How do I put all these things on? And what is the answer in verse 16? The Word of Christ. The way God moves to make me like Jesus, Ephesians 5, as he washes his bride, that's me, that's you, with what? The Word. If I am going to put these things on, I need to be in the Word of Christ. I need to have it in me constantly. This is memorizing. This is meditating. This is studying. This is teaching okay, and encouraging one another. This is what we sing, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. The songs that we sing are to be reminding us of the Word of God. This is one of the things why we want to sing psalms, because we want to memorize God's Word. That's what makes us like Christ. Not saying that man's words are bad, but God's words are far better. And that's one of the reasons he commands them to sing psalms, is because we want the Word of Christ to be constantly within us. Okay, But wh how are we doing this? How are we singing? How are we teaching? How are we admonishing? Okay, With what? With grace, not legalism. Okay, Some people have the idea, well, if we just sing the right music, our church will be perfect. No, it's God's grace that perfects the church. And we need to not do these things as the, you know, I've heard people be like, well, I've read my Bible every single day and God still hasn't saved my kids. No, it, it doesn't work that way. God works by grace. And we need to understand the means of grace is his word, but it is not something where you can hold God hostage that I memorized enough Bible verses and we sang the right music, therefore God must give me what I want. No, it's the means of grace where we are looking to Christ for grace through all of this. And how does he conclude this section of putting these things on? Whatever you do, whether it's words that come out of your mouth or it's actions, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We go, as Anthony said at the beginning, for God's glory. We live for his glory. We live for his name. 
The Christian life is, can I put Jesus' name on the words that come out of my mouth? This is one of the best things for my holiness about being a pastor, is when people find out what you do for a living, you can't show your tail. You know why? Because if I told them I'm a roofer and I act like an idiot, then you know what? It doesn't reflect poorly on my Savior. But when I say I am a Christian, I am a pastor, I need to act in such a way that Jesus Christ would be pleased. And this is part of why, of why evangelism is also good for your holiness. Because if you're sharing the gospel and people go, oh, you're a Christian? Yes, I am. Well, you better match it. You better be conformed to the image of Christ. So this is an important thing. Is it, how, how do I judge whether I'm doing these things? Just simply ask this question. Could I hang up the phone with the person or the telemarketer by saying, Jesus loves you, and Jesus approves of what I just said? Can you end your interaction with coworkers and family members? You know, sometimes you have to confront people. But can you confront people the way Jesus confronted people? And leave with his stamp of approval. This is, you know, this is the whole, uh, what was it, Sh Charles Sheldon book, uh, What Would Jesus Do? If you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ, then you need to make sure that everything you do would have his stamp of approval and actions in the way you speak to and act with others. All right, any questions or comments before we're, we close? All right.